we have a fantastic panel this afternoon. I think most of you have heard them at least once today. I won't read their bios. They have great bios in your program. But I will, they will speak in the order that they're seated. What I've done is I've asked them to take five minutes each to talk about next steps and whatever else they want to talk about in terms of diversity. And then I will open up the floor um, to you for any questions you may have in terms of how you move forward, um, any issues you may want to raise that you felt needs further hearing. So looking forward to our conversation. And we will start with Elizabeth McIsaac, who is on my far left, um, who will start off the conversation. She'll be followed by Matt, then by Marie, and then ending with Denise. And then I'll be back up here to facilitate our conversation. And what, we were, what happened today, we just released today a new paper that we did on diversity inclusion in the, uh, the not-for-profit sector, and I've got lots of copies if anyone's interested. That was my political announcement. Um, but we did this paper because we accidentally came across a stat that said that, we're actually, that the not-for-profit sector is not leading on this front. Um, it, wasn't, uh, it was an opportunistic sample. We looked at, at, at executive directors across the province, but what we discovered uh, was that the vast majority are white, middle-aged women who are leading the organizations. And that's one indicator. But the other indicator is we said, who of you has deliberate strategies and policies in place to make diversity happen? And the overwhelming answer was, nothing's in place. We speak it, we talk it. We do the talk all the time, but we don't walk the talk. We don't have the papers in place. And in, in organizational cultures, which every sector represents, it's, it's policies that make the difference. Um, it's something that you hold yourself to account to, that you can report on. Um, and if that's not there, then, there's, then it's not being valued, because that is how we, we express value um, and strategic priority. Uh, for, the, for the private sector, I, I would say it, it, it is a, a different picture, uh, although certainly not roses in, in that sector, sector, sector either. And I think depending on your organization and where you're at with your journey, you know, so we didn't talk about us. One of the um, uh, volunteer uh, roles I, I have, I have got myself involved in is, is leading Credit Work Canada, which is a, a not-for-profit group working with uh, organizations on how to improve the climate of inclusion for LGBT-identified uh, professionals in, in Canadian workplaces. And, and so, you know, now that we've grown the base we started with 12 partners that were very committed to the issue, and probably employers who were farther along in the journey, mostly because it started with employment equity, even though that wasn't necessarily a group. It's not like four designated groups, but certainly trying to advance your strategy beyond that, um, it seemed to be you know, a, a logical next step that most organizations are following. Um, you know, we're on a base now of 63 partners, so that actually tells you in terms of Canada and the private sector, people are getting away from just compliance and thinking about the larger Canadian demographic and how do you um, appeal to the broadest talent pool possible, which obviously includes uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Um, but the interesting thing now that we do have a very large um, partnership base is that we do see a, a wide variety in private sector uh, in terms of the spectrum. So employers like the accounting firms, like the banks, um, because of obviously legislative requirements that were Im imposed um, you know, 20 years ago or so, um, have been leading the, the, the practice, um, and employers or organizations like, um, in the last session, anybody who was just in with, with Wendy, like the law firms who have understood that this is really good for business in terms of their clients are um, very interested in this topic. And Pride of Canada has seen an explosion of interest in the last two years, I would say, within the legal industry. Um, I'll start globally, though. When I think of diversity, I think of opportunity. And the minister this morning, if, if those of you who are here for his talk, I think touched on the fact that we don't uh, capitalize on the opportunities that we can have in our diverse uh, um, population in Canada. We do to a certain extent, but maybe we're getting better. But I was just at a meeting yesterday, an external meeting uh, on the corporate board, and you're from CIBC, I know TD is well represented here, that's my bank, you're my mother's bank, I'm <laughs> But to be an equal opportunity panelist, um, Scotiabank was there yesterday, and they're very big in South America. And um, amazing opportunities for Canadian business in South America, amazing opportunities for Canadians here to be doing business, living here for South America. And um, two out of the three people that were there from Scotia were actually from the countries in South America. And my thought, and maybe it's because I was thinking about today's conference, I was thinking, it would really make sense to also have 
uh, first, second, even newcomers uh, from Canada from those countries who are educated here to be doing that work. Instead of listening to a lovely young woman who was complaining about our weather uh, from uh, a certain country, why not have, why not capitalize on what we have here? So I'll link this to a concrete example, and you know, I'm, I'm here at Ryerson, so I'm going to brag about Ryerson. Our president uh, recently signed an agreement with the Bombay Stock Exchange to start an incubator, much like we have. We have the biggest incubator for startups in Canada right here at Ryerson University. And he signed an agreement to uh, build one there and to have exchanges so people can come back and forth. Canadians go up there, uh, Indians can come here, and, uh, uh, and, and, and obviously the first uh, group that will probably take advantage of that are those that um, understand the culture. So I think a lot of things have been said that I probably would have stated already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, how nice. And America has been beat up upon. <laughs> so sheepishly, I say. Um, the GTA Ontario is a wonderful laboratory for diversity. That's why I came. If you can do diversity work here, I figured you could do it anywhere. And so my suggestion to you, uh, in, in terms of practical next steps, just to pick one or two items from what you heard here today, and pull together a working group, or allies, or friends, to begin that discussion. And in beginning that discussion, I find, at least in my own role, that building community seems to be the starting point for a lot of places. Building community across various different groups is extremely important. And while the data is important, I'm definitely a data person, I, I love the data. Even though we have the data in the states, I'll beat up on the states myself, even though we have the data, we have leaders who don't move forward. Even though the data clearly says there is action that needs to be taken. So in whatever way you find in your capacity to take action, I just simply ask to do it. So I think a lot of things have been said that I probably would have stated already. Uh, uh, how nice. And America has been beat up upon. <laughs> so sheepishly, I say. Um, the GTA Ontario is a wonderful laboratory for diversity. That's why I came. If you can do diversity work here, I figured you could do it anywhere. And so my suggestion to you, uh, in, in terms of practical next steps, just to pick one or two items from what you heard here today, and pull together a working group, or allies, or friends, to begin that discussion. And in beginning that discussion, I find, at least in my own role, that building community seems to be the starting point for a lot of places. Building community across various different groups is extremely important. And while the data is important, I'm definitely a data person, I, I love the data. Even though we have the data in the states, I'll beat up on the states myself, even though we have the data, we have leaders who don't move forward. Even though the data clearly says there is action that needs to be taken. So in whatever way you find in your capacity to take action, I just simply ask to do it. I mean, there's nothing um, that senior leaders pay attention to in a highly regulated industry when you lay down with regulations that they would potentially be in contravention of. Um, particularly the financial services industry and the papers love to beat up on the banks for anything they can. No one wants bad press on anything in terms of violation of, of a federal law or regulation. So I think, I think it got their attention at the beginning. 
that they knew that they needed to start thinking about it. I, I think if there was anything that's done um, incorrectly, it can, it can drive all kinds of unintended outcomes and bad behavior as well. Uh, but at least it, it, it made uh, senior leadership uh, agree that they need to focus time, and effort, resources on the topic. And, we, and, it's still, and, and truthfully, it still makes them nervous. Yes. Um, you know, we were audited, as I know a lot of the financial institutions were audited within the last two years. When, when you get that letter, everybody starts to panic a bit, you know. And what kind of measure does get done? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not um, against employment equity in terms of like so. So, Lisa Ray held a roundtable uh, two years ago, and the view of the government because I think the glass ceiling in, in terms of provincial and federal government is starting to crack a bit in terms of deputy ministers and ministers. Certainly in terms of, at the provincial level, I think 90% of, of Canadians are governed at the provincial level by a, by a woman, which is significantly different than we saw even five years ago. Um, so I think they're thinking, okay, well maybe we should drop women out of employment equity in terms of one of the designated groups. And the people around the table were like, no, but the fundamental flaw of employment equity is the fact that companies can report at aggregate levels. So what, you know, but not in terms of how you're advancing. So even though you you do provide the data kind of back sets of sheets that you have to send to the government, what they really care about is your is your total, right? And so what I said to Lisa was, you know, don't uh, don't necessarily you can't drop gender, um, but what you need to do is have different requirements around reporting advancement at senior levels. Sure. Just briefly, I think. Well, again, I'm biased because I work at a university, but I think education, 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 opportunities ed for education, opportunities for advancement. Canada lagged, I'll make you happy, we lag behind the United States in <laughs> uh, private sector uh, training programs. Uh, we uh, don't spend as much as American companies on training their employees, generally speaking. And I do believe that um, we, we want people to be treated equitably, but we also don't want them to suffer reverse discrimination later on. In other words, you're only here because you are category A, B, or C. We want them to be there because they've had the opportunity to fulfill their potential and be there. So I think education is the key. Um, I actually went to Princeton University. Uh, I went there for the Woodrow Wilson School of uh, Public and International Affairs. I was a part of a cohort of 85 plus people. I was the only black woman in that cohort. Not to say there weren't other qualified black women who could have been a part of that cohort, but they had instituted their own limit on excellence. And the cohort before that only had one, the cohort before that only had one. And so the idea of doing us a favor, it is not a favor. We have a right to be a part of the workforce and at all levels. Um, I've come up with this term that I call friendism. And friendism is, is a term that gets away from the implicit practice of discrimination, but when, as you move up higher, the interactions, your circles of people who you uh, um, interact with and so forth, tend to get smaller and smaller. And if that circle of, of friends, of colleagues, if that circle isn't diverse, if you're not engaging people who bring those messages, bring those ideas to the table, then our boards will continue to look the way they look. The comment earlier, you might have mentioned that there's only 12% representation of women and people of color on the board. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a very, uh, it's, it's very linked to the employment factor. Because when you're a newcomer or an immigrant, and you know, the, your first wish or desire is to find something, a uh, job and uh, employment that's meaningful to you, that's commensurate with your skills and experience. And I think when you're doing survival jobs, earning minimum wages, running from job to job, three jobs, or you know, doing the graveyard shift, being on boards and committees is gonna be the last thing on your mind. So I think there's a direct relation as to why there's underrepresentation, but it's all LinkedIn and boils down to, you know, 
the fact that we are not an inclusive society. Um, more and more, the conversation around diversity in corporations is around making the business case. It's around a value proposition. What happened to social justice? What happened to doing it because it is the right thing to do? What happened to we, we, we provide opportunities to include everyone because that's the kind of country we want to live in, that's the kind of society we're building? I don't think it's neither or. I think we have to keep the social justice there. I think, and this was in our analysis of looking at what was going on in the not-for-profit sector, which I think is the one out there saying that they're the, the sort of the moral conscience of the, of the community, um, where social justice has been the driver. And yet it wasn't being backed up with, with the policies and, and strategic commitments that need to be in place to make it happen. So I would argue that it's, it's one of the drivers, but it's not the only one. And I think the more robust the, the sort of set of, of arguments is, the greater chance you have of sustaining it and moving it forward. So it's, it's not either or, but I think we just keep building the number of, of imperatives for why we have to look at it. I would agree. I think it, I think it needs to be head and heart. Um, because the only concern that from a private sector lens on this is that if it's purely about corporate social responsibility or social justice, then there is a feeling of tokenism that creeps in. So if we are giving this, oh, because we have to, you know, it's our, it's our we, we should be doing something from a social justice point of view, versus looking at the really bright and talented individuals who just need access to opportunity, that's different than social justice. That's actually having a smart talent strategy. Um, then there is fear, and I see this actually happening with, with women around just diversity issues in general, that often there are women who are very afraid of diversity uh, programs on gender because they somehow feel it diminishes their credibility in terms of challenges that they, and barriers that they've had to basically break through to be where they're at. I would agree. I think it, I think it needs to be head and heart. Um, because the only concern that from a private sector lens on this is that if it's purely about corporate social responsibility or social justice, then there is a feeling of tokenism that creeps in. So if we are giving this, oh, because we have to, you know, it's our, it's our we, we should be doing something from a social justice point of view, versus looking at the really bright and talented individuals who just need access to opportunity, that's different than social justice. That's actually having a smart talent strategy. Um, then there is fear, and I see this actually happening with, with women around just diversity issues in general, that often there are women who are very afraid of diversity uh, programs on gender because they somehow feel it diminishes their credibility in terms of challenges that they, and barriers that they've had to basically break through to be where they're at. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.